Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Oded Milo. I'm from uh, the Hebrew University. Uh, the first talk uh, will be given by Leo Klein. Leo started uh, his career as a theoretician. He did his PhD under the supervision of uh, Amon Aroni. Then he moved to be an experimentalist, uh, working in Stanford with uh, Aaron Kapitulnik. And now he's in Bar Ilan University. Uh, Leo. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so my talk today is about the um, anomalous Hall effect in uh, strontium ruthenium O3. So in recent years, there is a lot of interest in um, anomalous Hall effect for various reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that um, anomalous Hall effect is um, uh, closely connected to the spin Hall effect, which is very important for spin tonics. But in, there is also another reason, and the reason is that um, there is a growing realization that the anomalous Hall effect is also very sensitive to the band structure and is also very sensitive to particular features in the band structure, including, for instance, the vial nodes that we heard about um, yesterday in uh, a couple of talks. So today I will describe the development of our understanding uh, about the anomalous Hall effect in strontium ruthenium O3, including a very recent um, results, very um, surprising uh, results, which indicate very intriguing properties of the band structure in strontium ruthenium O3. So before I start, I would like to um, acknowledge my collaborators along the, along the way from Bar Ilan and from um, Stanford. So in magnetic conductors, when you're talking about the Hall effect, there are two uh, contributions that uh, we need to consider. One contribution is the contribution that we find in all metals, which is the ordinary Hall effect, which is uh, related to the interaction between the charge carriers and the magnetic field. But there is also another term which uh, can be described phenomenologically as the interaction between the current and the magnetization. And this is the anomalous uh, Hall effect. Now, it's important to, to stress that the anomalous Hall effect is not an effect due to the magnetization itself that is induced in the, in, the magne in the magnetic conductor, but it is really something which is related to the magnetic moments themselves, either by scattering due to the magnetic moments or due to the um, band structure which is manifested by the magnetization itself. When we discuss different mechanisms for the anomalous Hall effect, um, there is a class of uh, mechanism which is uh, called uh, extrinsic uh, models. And um, in these models, we are talking about um, scattering of the charge carriers with a broken symmetry. I mean, there is a different um, um, probability for, for spin, alec spin up electrons to scatter um, right or left due to the uh, spin orbit interaction. Now, in normal metals, this breaking of symmetry will not cause any um, uh, effect and any Hall effect. But in itinerant ferromagnets, where you have a spin polarized um, Fermi surface, and you have population of more electrons with one kind of spin, this asymmetry also leads to um, um, transverse voltage, which is an anomalous Hall effect. Now, these different mechanisms, which are described as a skew scattering, as a side jump scattering, are uh, characterized by different um, dependencies on the resistivity um, itself. Now, in addition to this um, extrinsic model, there is the, what is called the intrinsic models. And this is um, an effect which is closely related to the band structure itself, or in more specifically, to the Berry phase that is associated with the band structure of, of, the, of the conductors. Now, this Berry phase act as effective magnetic field, which leads to this um, anomalous um, Hall effect. And in magnetic conductors, the Berry phase, they actually the effective field does not average to, um, to zero. So in this me mechanism, which is an intrinsic band property, sigma xy is, is a band property, and it is constant. When, when, the band, when the band structure does not is constant, also sigma xy is, not, um, is constant. 
So if sigma xy, for instance, for some material is constant as a function of, of temperature, then rho xy would also be, it will be proportional to, um, to rho square. This is for this um, mechanism. Um, furthermore, um, it was this paper in 2003 that pointed out that specific properties in the band structure, they called it magnetic monopoles, but now using the more common jargon, you would call it a vial nodes in the band structure of strontium ruthenate. This is uh, that, that um, these magnetic monopoles can lead to, uh, can make a very significant contribution to the anomalous Hall effect. And they claim that this is actually uh, these features of the band structure which can explain the anomalous Hall effect <coughs> in strontium ruthenate. Now, since strontium ruthenate is a material that I have been working on for the last 20 years, then <coughs> Of course, I was very intrigued by this, by this claim. And actually, this paper uh, motivated um, to look into this property more closely. And this is actually the topic of my, <coughs> my talk here. I mean, to, to explore what is really um, the, the mechanism that leads to the anomalous Hall effect in strontium ruthenate. Now, before I describe this um, uh, experimental um, results, I'd like a few words about strontium ruthenate. So strontium ruthenate is a magnetic perovskite, an itinerant ferromagnet, at 4D itinerant ferromagnet, because magnetism is coming from the ruthenium. Um, our study was on uh, epitaxial thin films, MBE grown thin films of strontium ruthenate, very high quality films. And um, in this film, the, we, we see a very large uniaxial uh, magnetocrystalline um, anisotropy an anisotropy field on the order of seven Tesla. So this is really a very, very strong uniaxial magnetocrystalline anisotropy. Um, and um, we, the, the, the films that we have been studying are very, very clean and very, very uniform. So throughout the, the film, you have just a single uh, easy axis. Now, this is how the normal solar effect in strontium ruthenate, um, uh, this is how it looks like. So you see that uh, th this is a resistivity and this is rho xy. And the main feature that you see here that the rho xy is, is non-monotonic and it also changes sign. Now, you may have such a behavior also when you have, uh, let's say, just an extrinsic model and you have contributions that will be proportional to rho and rho square. But in this case, you would um, um, you'd expect to the, the rho term would dominate at, at low resistivities, and the rho square term will dominate at high resistivities. <laughs> but what we see here that at low temperature, the resistivity, the rho xy, is is proportional to, to rho square, and it's still you see this um, non-monotonic um, behavior. So this was one the main feature that. Uh, um, Actually, um, for, for this reason, the, the group that uh, um, st uh, studied the anomalous Hall effect in strontium ruthenate and thought that um, it is actually a magnetic monopole which is responsible for, um, for this behavior, these are the features that they try to explain using this, um, this band structure. Um, the, I didn't talk about it, but the spinner orientation is a, is a transition that the direction of the uniaxial is going from 150K, which is TC, down to um, a zero te temperature limit. And the um, direction of the magnetic moment is changing by 15 degrees at the rate of one degree per 10 degrees uh, uh, Celsius. So, so this orientation transition is not relevant to this, uh, um, to this study, but there is a very, very gradual change in the, in the direction of the uniaxial uh, uh, magnetocrystalline isotopy. So the way that uh, this group tried to, to explain this behavior was as following. Um, strontium ruthenate is an itinerant ferromagnet, so the, the band is exchange split. And they assumed that as the temperature is going, the exchange split is closing. So closing the exchange split actually changes the band. And this change of the band 
changes the contribution, the intrinsic contribution to the anomalous soil effect. And, and this is the reason that we see this non-monotonic uh, behavior. So this, this was the, their explanation. And what you see here, in the, this is the, the a plot here, you see the anomalous soil effect um, as a function of the magnetization. This is experimental results for different uh, samples that they, they use. And you see here, the, the continuous lines are the cal calculation. And this calculation, you see, they are very sensitive to the details of the structure of the material. So, and in addition, they, they assume that you have an exchange splitting uh, closing at EC, which we had very good reasons to, to doubt that this is what happens because there are other experimental evidence that show that exchange splitting does not close at EC and, t and magnetization is not lost due to uh, uh, amplitude vanishing, but due to fluctuation of the magnetization. So that's why we um, um, were quite skeptical about these this results and intrigued us to look into it more, more closely. So the questions that, that we ask, I mean, how can we probe such a claim? I mean, they claim that, that the, 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 this is the, the origin of this unusual behavior of the anomalous soil effect. So this is a purely band structure, that everything is due to changing of, of the band structure. And actually, the magnitude of magnetization is just a measure of the closing of, of the gap. So to probe this, um, this argument, we concentrate on a, on a specific point in this rho xy versus temperature. We looked at the point that, that the anomalous soil effect vanishes. And we asked, I mean, if we have this point that it vanishes, why does it vanish? Does it vanish because we are here at a specific rho xx, which would indicate that you have extrinsic um, mechanism that dominate, or you have berry phase that doesn't change, um, uh, with, with uh, bands that doesn't change? Or does it vanish because you are at a specific value of the magnetization? Which means that this is because, uh, according to this, to this scenario. So to probe this scenario, we, we acted as following. I mean, you can reach this point, this point of resistivity and magnetization by doing experiments at higher temperatures. At higher temperatures, you are at higher resistivities and a lower magnetization. And by applying a magnetic field, you can both decrease the resistivity and increase the magnetization. So the question, if we start at higher points, if we start at higher points, and this is what happens when you start at higher points, this is a normal solar effect or XY, and you start at different te temperatures above this temperature, the temperature that it vanishes is 127. And by applying magnetic field, you can actually decrease the anomalous solar effect until you can see the normal soil effect vanish. It, it vanishes. So the question, at what point does it vanish? So what we found is that whenever, whatever the temperature that we started, and we're applying a magnetic field, we see that anomalous soil effect vanishes at exactly the same resistivity. But as we apply magnetic field, you not only decrease the resistivity, you also increase magnetization. So how do you know what, what, what is the reason? But the point is that if we start at, at, a, at a higher temperature, let's say at 134K, uh, and you compare the resistivity at this temperature to, to the resistivity that is at 127 where the anomalous soil effect vanishes, the difference in the resistivity is not only due to the changes in magnetization, because there are other sources of changes in magnetization. So, Part of the uh, difference is magnetic and part is non-magnetic. So if it was a magnetization, which was important, then we would see vanishing before we reach this resistivity. But we see that every time with the um, uh, normal soil effect uh, vanishes, it vanishes as exactly the same resistivity. So this tells us that uh, um, the scenario that was proposed that this is a reason for the unusual behavior of the anomalous soil effect, the changes of the band structure is, 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 not, not, is incorrect. <coughs> and we see that what, what determines here the anomalous soil effect is actually the resistivity. <coughs> but we checked it here just at one, one point. I mean, if we want to check this, 
this assumption at many other points, we want to look at different films with different resistivities and to see if the anomalous solar effect scales with resistivity. But if you want to change resistivity a lot, but you don't want to make your sample more disorder, you don't want to, to ruin your sample in order to change the resistivity, one way to achieve it is to look at, for, at films with um, much, much thinner films. Because if you look, go to films which are ultra thin, then you increase the resistivity, you increase the scattering, but at the same time you are not uh, introducing disorder into, into your film. So that's why we looked at what happens if you take a series of films with different, uh, different thicknesses. So here what you see is the longitude and resistivity for this range of uh, for different films. This is the anomalous Hall effect for, for all these films. This is the extracted prefactor RS for <coughs> all, all these films. The, here is plotted as a function of temperature. And here this prefactor, which we assume that it should be depend just on resistivity as a function of resistivity and doesn't look like it is scaling. Doesn't look like it depends just on the resistivity. But if we take all these curves and we normalize the resistivity by the resistivity where rho x y is vanish, uh, where, where it is vanish, where it vanishes, and we normalize Rs by the maximum value, we see that everything just goes on top of each other. So all these curves just scale on top of each other. So now, why would we need to, to rescale rho x6 by, by some factor? So um, one possibility is that we have here a dead layer. So actually, when we are looking at a film of 6 nanometer, this is not the actual thickness of the film. The actual thickness of the film is, is, is thinner. So to, to prop this um, uh, possibility, so we assume that you, we have, if we assume that we have um, in all films the same uh, thickness of dead layer, then we expect a linear dependence between um, the thickness of the film divided by the resistivity where rho x y is vanishing as a function of film thickness. And you see this linear dependence. So indeed, the idea that this is what we have, a dead layer, is indeed um, um, is successful here. Moreover, if we scale the resistivity, we saw here all the resistivities, all the films, as a function of temperature. Now, if we scale resistivity with the same factor, we get all these scales here, which is very reasonable. Because if you're taking different films, different thicknesses, then you expect that the effect of the film thickness will be important when the mean free pass is on the order of the thickness of the film. You don't expect it to affect much resistivity at high resistivities where the mean free pass is, is much, much smaller. And this is indeed what we see. We see that the resistivity is high temperature of all in all films is the same, and then they split just as we go down um, in temperature. So this uh, tells us that indeed the rho xy is indeed determined by, by the resistivity. The, this uh, experiments were done uh, below TC in the remanent state of the magnetization. But then we wanted also to extend this uh, region where we are exploring the behaviors of anomalous solar effect also above TC and to look at the uh, anomalous solar effect in the paramagnetic uh, part. And what you see here in this curve is Rs, the prefactor, as a function of rho x6 both in both below and above um, the Curie temperature. And you see in a very wide range of uh, temperature, you have this scaling of, of Rs as a function of uh, resistivity. So now, but still, there was a question, I mean, so what can explain this, this non-uniform, this non-monotonic behavior? I mean, how can we get dependence of, on rho square at low resistivities, and then we see this, this change in the, in the behavior as we go up in temperature. So the model that we are uh, suggesting is that we have here two contributions. We have a contribution which is a side jump, which is an extensive contribution and will give you dependence on rho square. But we also have a contribution, that's a very phase contribution, an intrinsic <coughs> contribution, which is also 
uh, will also give you a dependence on rho square. But the point is that if we look at what happens to the berry phase contribution at higher temperatures, then if you're looking at the Kubo formula to, to calculate this, this uh, um, uh, contribution, then you expect that the scattering time will affect the uh, sigma xy that you, you get from, from this contribution. So you expect the intrinsic contribution to be suppressed as you are going to higher resistivities. So as you go to higher resistivities and the intrinsic uh, contribution is suppressed, this is why we see this uh, competing behavior and you, you see this uh, uh, sign change. And what you see this curve here is for all this extended temperature range, it is uh, a fit to this, uh, uh, to this formula um, here. <coughs> so our understanding at this point was that we have both contribution, both intrinsic contribution and extrinsic um, contribution that is affecting here, but you, you have different temperature dependence, the different resistivity dependence for the, two, uh, for the two contributions. Now, we wanted to say, I mean, okay, if you just look at the dependence on, on the resistivity on this prefactor, the rho square de dependence, really doesn't uh, give you a, a clear distinction between a contribution which is intrinsic, band structure, or a contribution which is um, extrinsic. So that's why we thought maybe we should look at ana another um, thing that, that where, where the two contributions will have different, different effects. And what we wanted to look at, what happens when you are changing the orientation of the magnetization. Now, if the effect is extrinsic, then you would expect, I mean, the anomalous soul effect is what is called isotropic effect. What all is matter is just the component of the magnetization which is perpendicular uh, to the film. You are changing the orientation, you are changing the perpendicular component, and that's why th th this is the only uh, effect that, that comes in into this uh, orientation dependence. However, if the effect is intrinsic, then changing the magnetization direction will have a much more profound effect. Moreover, if, if you have such unusual uh, properties in, in the band structure like uh, vinyl nodes, then you expect to, that, that this change in the orientation will be even more, more significant in such, in such materials. So that's why we wanted to see, okay, what happens when we are changing the magnetization? And we wanted to, to, to probe this in, in uh, samples where um, the, uh, the berry phase scenario is, is, not, is not suppressed. So we wanted to check it uh, in, in films where the resistivity is as small as possible. So these measurements were done in, in films with a resistivity ratio of 90, which is quite remarkable for, uh, for strontium um, ruthenate. So what we wanted to see, I mean, since also the ordinary Hall effect for such clean films at this temperature is, is nonlinear, it is not so easy to decompose the contribution of the whole effect, the ordinary whole effect, and the anomalous whole effect. So in order to, to probe the orientational dependence of the anomalous whole effect, we wanted to, to check, to, to compare two states where you have the same magnetic field, but different orientations of the magnetization. So one way to do it is, for instance, we did this uh, hysteresis loops, and we apply the magnetic field here quite, quite close to the hard axis. Now, normally, when you are looking at hysteresis loop of, of anomalous Hall effect, you get hysteresis loop which are proportional to the normal hysteresis loops that you get from a magnetometer. Yeah, so this is, for instance, what we get, or XY that we get at 30K. So it looks very, it's very similar to what you get in a normal magnetization curve of a magnetometer. But this is what we get here at 10K, when we are applying this magnetic field close to the hard axis, we see this crossing, okay? So rho xy actually is proportional to the magnetization, but, so what, but you see here that the, the, 
difference in the rho xy between the two, two uh, uh, um, curves changing sign. So this is an indication that actually um, rho xy is changing sign as a function of ch changing this uh, orientation. Now, here it, this is another way of, of looking at what happens when you are just changing the magnetization. We can, the, the magnetization is oriented along the easy axis, and if we are just rotating the magnetic field, then there is a point where the magnetization will jump. And what we are looking at, what happens to the size of the jump and the sign of the jump as we are increasing the magnetic field. And what we see here, this is the delta rho xy, namely the, the size of the jump in the, the uh, rho xy as a function of the field that we are using to, to rotate. So you see that as we increase the magnetic field, so this is, for instance, you see the 2k, we start with very small rho xy, which is actually a remanent anomalous Hall effect. But then as we are increasing the field, you see that we get jumps which are order of magnitude larger than the remanent anomalous Hall effect, and with, even with an opposite sign. Now this is another way of seeing the effect of the change in the orientation. We applied magnetic fields on both sides of the uh, normal to the film, symmetric around the, the normal to the film. And we looked at the difference in, in, in the rho xy uh, as a function of magnetic field. So you see that as we are increasing the magnetic field, the difference is increasing and you get differences which are much, much larger than the initial, the, the remanent anomalous Hall effect. So this is, indicates that the magnetic field has uh, the changing orientation has a very large effect. So now the question that we ask I me, mean, is, okay, is it possible to explain this behavior that we have that the, the whole effect, the total whole effect, is determined just by the component of the magnetic field which is perpendicular to the film and the magnetic orientation. And I, I cannot get into details, but, but this is an attempt to scale the data with such an assumption that you really can decompose the two effects. And you see this failure of decomposing, which indicates that actually you cannot really decompose the two, uh, the two effects. The two effects are really very strongly um, intermixed. So here I wanted to, to mention that, that qualitatively, this is the kind of effects that you'd expect from a ferromagnet with vial nodes um, with the effect of changing the, the magnetic uh, orientation. And that there are different papers, theoretical papers, that stress that indeed this is what you have in strontium booth and that indeed what you have in the bulk is this band crossing which leads to this kind of, of features in, in, the, in the band structure. So to, to conclude, um, we see a dramatic effects in the anomalous Sol effect, which are due to changes in the magnetic um, or orientation. And, um, well, of course, we are, we are, we are not able to, to show directly, uh, based on calculations, that this is what you would expect from this band structure. But this kind of uh, very, very uh, dramatic effects are not expected for uh, it's certainly not for extrinsic, um, extrinsic um, mechanism and not only for a regular um, um, band structure, but this is probably a strong indication for very unusual features in the band structure of strontium ruthenate that gives rise to such a behavior in the anomalous Hall effect. And what we plan to do next is to take these uh, samples to the high field lab in order to, to get into to explore this uh, feature um, when we are going to really very high fields because all these fields were done up to 8 Tesla, 9 Tesla, and if we go to, to much higher fields, maybe we'll get a much better idea of what's going on here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. No more. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you focused on, on row X, Y. I mean, why? Usually, I mean, if it's flat structure quantity, aren't you supposed to be looking at X, Y? Um, yeah, but yeah, but I'm, I'm not doing band calculation. I'm, I'm measuring and measuring. Yeah. 
Ja, ja. Ja, but it, I mean, but it really doesn't matter for what what I showed here. I mean, if you're looking at sigma x y or x y. Um, Right, right, right. So, 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 sigma, yeah, yeah, right. So, sigma x y. I mean, if you plot it, rho x y will just give you something that goes like rho x x square. Yes. So, okay. So, the other question is, what is the vast structure? You didn't show us the vast structure of this material. Are there wild? Um, well, no, I mean, no, there was a claim in the first thing you showed. Them. Yeah, I mean, the, the are they relative to the Fermi energy. I mean, they, they are not at the Fermi surface. Where are they? Are they, are they 15 millivolts away or, or 100, 1,000 millivolts away? Where, where are they relative? I, I, I cannot give you the parameter how, how far away, but they are not very far away. I mean, it's not. Uh, OK, one more question. Yeah. Just quickly, um, as far as I know, in Strontium Garrity Prosk at 113, uh, both Yuri and I know the recent ARPAs suggest there is a vial node. Right, uh, along the lines you suggested. I don't think Hall effect shows anything interesting. Do you, uh, do you, do you have any comment? No. <laughs> I, I, I didn't measure this, this material. I don't know. Okay, so let's thank uh, Leo again. <laughs>